Hello sophomores, we're going to talk about religious life and the hope is that in looking at religious life which includes in the Christian conception of it a promise of celibacy, we'll be better able to understand what married life is supposed to be within the Christian and Catholic faith. And that might seem like a weird contrast going on there, but trust me it'll make sense in the end. So in terms of religious life, uh, you might be thinking about people of hermits or monks or nuns or that sort of thing. And if we go very way back in the early church, what we find is that there are a number of unmarried people who intentionally remain unmarried for the sake, uh, for, out of love for God. And St. Paul advises those who are unmarried to remain so if possible. It's not a rule, it's not mandatory, but he says, ah, if, it's, if you can pull it off, do it. And so there are a lot of people who take him up on that advice. Now these might be people who had never married, young men and women, or these might be old people who had their spouse die. And so they intentionally choose not to get married again in order to, de to dedicate themselves to God. Now in the early church, uh, some of these people were uh, martyrs and oftentimes virgin martyrs. So you get a lot of young women who are revered as virgin martyrs or martyrs. And the idea is that in their life and their death, they get dedicated themselves to God. Now some of the people on this list uh, were already mothers. I, I believe Felicity and Perpetua were. But some of the others uh, remained virgins. And so they had this double glory of being both a virgin and dying for their faith. So-called white martyrdom and red martyrdom at the same time. And these are people who are largely the precursors of some of the modern monks and nuns. We go a little bit later and we get a group of people called the Desert Fathers. We also have the Desert Mothers too, but they're less well known. And the Desert Fathers were hermits who sought union with God in prayer and in solitude. And the big name amongst these people was St. Anthony of Egypt. He was, came from a wealthy family, decided, uh, walked by a church and heard God calling him to give up everything and follow him. So he uh, sent his younger sister that he was in charge of to a convent. He gave them plenty of money so she would be well taken care of. And then he went into the desert. And the thing about Anthony is people heard about this guy and, and oh, this is a holy man. Hey, we should go live by him and he can help us. So Anthony, there's a community that starts growing up around Anthony. Finally, Anthony decides, hey, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be a hermit. I don't, I don't want all these people around. So he goes even farther out into the desert and more people follow him there. But this is, uh, again, you get the kind of the organic development of monasteries. It was people who were really serious about trying to live Christian life and they decided that they were going to live by other people who had spent a lot of time trying to be serious about Christian life and hopefully those older people would help the younger people know which way to go. So that's kind of the origin of the monasteries. We go a little bit later, we get a huge name in uh, Western history, St. Benedict of Nursia. And I know what you're thinking, who? Well, this is the guy responsible for what we now know today as monks and nuns. Um, he wrote a rule, the rule of St. Benedict, which is what is adopted by a lot of communities and kind of became the standard for monks in the Western Church. And so his, um, he's the founder of the Benedictines. Uh, those are the monks who wear black. You know, you're probably familiar with, see them in movies, all that sort of thing. That's them. And so he had this rule of life that he wrote that, that governed so much of community life. You know, how you're going to eat, when you're going to pray, what you're going to pray, how you're going to work, you know, how you're going to walk down the hallway, all this sort of stuff. How you elect a new abbot, you know, who's in charge, who has responsibility, all this stuff. But the idea is that we're going to live in this community and we're going to have these rules and in really living out the spirit of this community, we're going to become holy. And that gets to the the essential bit of what's included in religious life. And all religious make three, at least three vows. Some make more, but at, they do at least three. The first is a vow of poverty. So you can't claim any goods as your own. Even if something is given to you for your use, like this beautiful laptop that I'm staring at right now, or this nice big screen uh, external monitor that I have, I can use them and they're, they're in the room that I sleep in. But I can't really think of them as mine if the provincial comes in and says, hey, Nick, I need that screen for my office. Okay, it's got to go. So that's poverty. Chastity uh, is where you um, 
choose to remain unmarried for the sake of the gospel, and it ex excludes all genital activity, so nothing, not a, no fooling around, nothing. It's you're dedicating your body to the Lord. And finally, there's obedience. Now, most people, when you ask them, when they look at these three, poverty, chastity, and obedience, they think chastity is the toughest. That, that's got to be really hard, you know, that celibacy. But most most celibates will tell you it's actually obedience that's the toughest. And St. Thomas Aquinas says that it's the best of all of the three vows. It's the most important. And obedience is basically giving up your life in a sense. It's not just you're giving up your goods, you're giving up your body, but you are giving up your very will, how, you're, how you decide you want to live your life. And you let go of that and you let someone else decide, the abbot or the provincial. So there are really three goods that are given up here. You give up your possessions, you give up your body, and you give up your own soul with obedience. And that's the most precious gift, says St. Thomas. That's why it's the best. It's also the most difficult and, in a sense, also the most rewarding and the most purifying. So here's a question for you. Is God calling you to be religious? Why not? And statistically speaking, most of you are not being called to religious life. I mean, it's just statistically probably not going to happen. But every single one of you, I think, should think about religious life and priesthood. You might think, why? Well, that seems so odd. And I think if you do so, it's actually going to make you, help you enter marriage in a, a better way, in a better frame of mind. You know, a lot of, of bishops uh, have talked about the vocations crisis in this country, and they said the real vocations crisis is not that we aren't getting enough priests. There's actually been an uptick in vocations. They said the real vocation crisis is a crisis in marriage because people don't see marriage as something holy, as something that they do to make themselves and others holy, as a calling by God. Now, Here's why I think that's the case. There's a lot of really good reasons to get married, get, get married that have nothing to do with Jesus. Atheists get married for very good reasons. You know, there's the mutual support, there's the comfort, there's more financial stability, there's, uh, you know, the, the emotional and the physical satisfaction. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing in a lot of ways, even apart from God. So there's a lot of really good reasons to get married that have nothing to do with the call to Christian life. And I think a lot of Christian people, including a lot of Catholics, decide to get married for those other reasons and not because they love Jesus and not because they want their marriage to let, let them um, mold them and form them as Christians. But here's the thing. Not many people becoming monks and nuns who are atheists. That's, that's a much more faith-driven uh, calling. So here's the thing, if you're willing to consider religious life and or priesthood, what you're doing is you're putting yourself in a frame of mind where you're saying, I want to follow and do what God has asked me to do. And I'm going to look at this way of life that's very ancient and very beautiful and, you know, we'll see if, if God wants it for me. And that will make you, I think, more faithful and more generous. And if you look honestly into it and, and you decide, no, this isn't what God is asking of me, then guess what? When you go to get married, you can say, ah, this is where God wants me to go. This is something beautiful. This is a great calling. And so you look at marriage not because, hey, it's financially stable. I get emotional support. There's this uh, beautiful physical intimacy, which is very beautiful. But I'm doing, doing it because I want to be holy and I want to help make this other person holy. There's a story about Mother uh, Teresa of Calcutta, and this uh, young man uh, came up to her one day and said, Mother, you know, uh, what does it feel like to be a saint? <laughs> Which is a, a question that could really tempt your humility, you know, it could easily trip you up. And Mother Teresa had a very beautiful response. She said, I'm glad you can see Christ in me, young man, because I can see Christ in you. But holiness is not for some of us, but for all of us. And that's something that we've forgotten, that marriage is a calling to holiness. So think about religious life, be open to it, and I think that will put you in the proper frame of mind to have 
a truly Christian marriage.